Good morning and welcome to SACAP's Student Study Hack for 2022. I'm your host, Kirsten Harrison. Um, I'm also the program coordinator for the Johannesburg campus. As we know, studying in 2022 looks very different to studying 10 years ago. Learning and education keeps evolving with time. Today, we'll discuss some of the best study practices, methods for good mental health during exams, and how to balance your focus with fun to help you cope emotionally, physically, and mentally with your matric exams and whatever comes next. And now to the exciting part, let me introduce our panelists. First up, we have Casey Peterson, who will take us through some techniques and methods for good mental health during the stressful time. Then we have Bukle Mahole, who delves into some study tips that work, as well as her own experiences while studying. Last but not least, Galoom van der Velt will take us through how necessary fun is when trying to focus so often. Over to you, Casey. Good morning, everyone. I am Casey Peterson. I am a student registered counselor working at SACAP as a work integrated learning coordinator. So before I take you through methods for good mental health practice, I think we all need to have at least a general understanding of what mental health is and ideally what good mental health should look like. So on the next slide, we can see that mental health is defined as a state of mental well-being that affects the way we think, feel and act, thus determining how we handle stress, relate to others and make healthy choices. On the next slide, we see that generally poor mental health is when we find it difficult to manage how we think, feel and act in relation to our daily stresses. Then good mental health is thus the absence of that. So it's feeling positive about ourselves and others, the ability to form good relationships, sorry, good relationships with other individuals and having that resilience or the flexibility to overcome the challenges that we might face. So as students and having gone through the pandemic, it is important to note that it is okay if during all these changes that you were not or you are still not coping. It was a big change that happened overnight and we all sort of had to adapt to it. But for you as students, you had to switch from face-to-face -face learning to online classes and then back again, which hasn't necessarily been an easy transition. So for example, during lockdown and undergoing online schooling, maybe you had to manage having added responsibilities over and above school, whether it be extra chores at home or you know, your personal responsibilities, as well as that continuous expectation to achieve within this new platform of online school, which continued with the transition back to face-to-face -face learning. So with all the restrictions and precautions put into place to ensure that everyone else is safe, you know, there was a lot to sort of consider moving back to face-to-face -face learning. And now with COVID sort of being something of the past and everything just go automatically going back to normal, it's big transitions that um, we all had to go through and we all expected to just adapt immediately to the change. But I would like to commend, you know, you as students, you had that resilience to take on online schooling, as well as going back to school with COVID restrictions and now going back to school with no restrictions. So, which is why positive, having a positive mental health is important during all these changes, but especially during exam times. So moving on to the next slide, we'll see that when we experience high levels of exam stress, it interferes with our ability to pay attention when studying. It reduces our working memory. So how we hold on to and work with the information stored in our short-term memory and thus leading to a lower performance. So throughout my talk today, I would like to touch on three main points in relation to mental health during exam times. The first is how to know when you have too much on your plate, how to manage stress during exam times, and lastly, how to manage your own expectations when applying to tertiary education institutions. So all three points play a role in the stress that you experience as a, as a matriculant or student preparing for final exams, as well as for your future studies. 
So when it comes to preparing for exams, our main focus is to ensure that we spend most of our time behind our desk studying, right? But on top of that, we are sort of still human and we have to engage in day-to-day -day activities, whether it be chores around the house, making time for family, or even simple activities of your parents wanting you to go with them for, to the shops, for example, which then leads me to my first point of how do you know when you have too much on your plate? So some of the signs include feeling overwhelmed and you don't know where to start, working on the weekends, sleeplessness, you make silly mistakes when doing simple tasks, you find it difficult to prioritize, you struggle to stay focused while you're studying, you're feeling stressed or anxious, and you experience student burnout where you are facing ongoing stress and you find that you have no time to relax or even recharge. These are just a few of the signs of how you can identify if you have too much on your plate. And now that you are aware of some of those signs, I would like to provide you with a few tips and tricks to help manage having too much on your plate. And these include prioritizing what is most important to least important, breaking up bigger tasks into smaller manageable aspects, getting enough sleep, exercise, and reaching out to a trusted friend, teacher, or family member to ask for help. Okay, moving on to my next point of how to manage stress during exam time, as well as during your preparations for your exam. Having trouble making decisions. Feeling overwhelmed, you have tense muscles or headaches, you experiencing trouble sleeping or getting out of bed in the morning, you are fidgeting, nail biting, teeth grinding, etc. So you don't have to experience all of these signs, but if you can identify with some of them, then you are experiencing some sort of stress in relation to in relation to um, exam time. So a few tips that I would like to provide you with to help combat the signs of exam stress that you might experience includes preparing for your exams in advance. So sometimes we think we are, you know, a superhero of some sort, and we think we can cram a whole year of work into a night or two before the day of the exam. However, the more time you spend studying, the more prepared you will feel. And the more prepared you feel on the day of your exam, the less stressed you will, ex the less stress you will experience as you feel more confident in yourself and your abilities as you write. The next point is don't sacrifice your sleep. So if you want your brain to perform at a higher level on the day of your exam, you need at least seven to eight hours of sleep. So all night as well preparing, especially the night before your exam is a no-go because the lack of sleep that you will then experience, especially the night before your exam, worsens your productivity and thus clouds your memory while you are writing. Then remain positive. So an easy way to combat stress is to remain positive. And a good way to remain positive, especially while preparing for your exams, is to take a break. Um, so it is important to take a break while you are studying to give your brain a rest. So it can be five to 10 minutes spent outside taking a walk, for example. Mm. Then the next point is engage in physical activity. So even 15 minutes of physical activity a day can help reduce stress levels. And then you can continue with your exam prep in a more effective way. So even if it's just a 15 minute walk that you take outside, then eat healthily. Healthy food fuels your brain. And lastly, talk to people you trust. So as a student, you do need moral support or a support system, especially during exam time. So if you are feeling anxious about your upcoming exams, don't keep your worries to yourself. Um, something to always keep in mind is that a problem shared is always a problem halved, okay? And for this, a few techniques that I would like to provide you to help manage exam stress includes guided meditation, mindfulness, peer sharing, yoga, a nature walk, and even deep breathing. So please remember that for me, these are merely suggestions that I am providing you. And it's then up to you to sort of try them out and find the technique that works best for you um, to help manage your stress. 
And lastly, I would like to touch on how to manage your expectations when applying to tertiary institutions. So the first point that I have with regards to that is separate your self-worth from the outcome. So when you are applying for university and you, do, and you don't necessarily receive the outcome that you were hoping for or the response you were hoping for, don't think that you are not good enough. You need to remember that there are thousands of students applying to university and capacity wise, the university can only accept so many students for each degree. The next point is to be realistic. Um, in terms of being honest with yourself. So if you know that you didn't get the results you were hoping for during your final exams, then you shouldn't apply for a degree that requires high marks. So for example, rather apply for a diploma to help aid you in getting into a bachelor's degree upon complete completion of that diploma. And always be realistic with yourself in terms of applying for a degree based on the results that you have received. And lastly, try and try again. So build from the experience so that you can improve for the next time. Or you could use the time to look for other avenues. So for example, you can engage in job shadowing and identify if the field that you want to go into before studying is something that you see yourself doing and enjoying for the rest of your life or for your future. And with this, you can also build on your skills. So for example, taking up bridging courses to strengthen your application for when you apply the next time. So when we don't receive the outcome we are hoping for, whether it be not receiving the matrix results that we are looking for, we always think that it's, end of the, that it's the end of the world, but there are other options to help strengthen your application or ways in which you can engage in activities of the specific field that you want to go into to see if you view yourself doing this for the rest of your life okay so never think that it's the end there's always an opportunity to be had okay and finally i would like to leave you with a mindfulness activity so why have i chosen a mindfulness activity um, mindfulness inhibits your stress response as it reduces activity in your amygdala so the part of your brain that is responsible for your flight or flight, fight or flight response. So when you, with a reduced or with reduced activity in that part of your brain, you become more aware of your thoughts. You don't react to a situation immediately. It switches on your being mode of mind. It increases your ability to focus and it results in, an, in improved memory and mental processing speed as well as it improves your ability to adapt to stressful situations. So the more calm and at peace you feel during your exam, the less likely you are to view that exam as a threatening experience. Okay, so now onto the mindfulness activity I have planned. So if you are all comfortable, I would like for you to begin in a comfortable seated position. Feel rooted, safe, and comfortable through your seat. Okay. Once you are settled, if you are comfortable, I would like for you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Inhale for a count of four and exhale for a count of four. Try to keep your, bre your breathing at the slow pace. As you inhale, imagine that you are breathing in calmness, peace, and strength. And as you exhale, imagine that you are breathing out all of your anxiety, stress, and worry. As you continue to inhale and exhale for a count of four, know that there is nothing for you to worry about right now in this present moment. All you need to focus on in this moment is to breathe. Feel your stress and anxiety slip away with each exhale.
If your mind drifts to feelings of worry, be mindful. Notice it without any judgment and then bring your attention back to your breathing. Know that you are resilient and you can handle anything that life has thrown at you. And as you continue breathing, notice how calm you feel. Take one last deep breath in and out. And when you are comfortable, you can slowly open your eyes and take this feeling of re relaxation with you. Okay. So thank you for participating. It was a short activity, but it's just an example of something that you can do. For example, if you do feel stressed during, your, during or before your exam, um, breathing is sort of a nice way to ground yourself in the moment and to release all of the stress and anxiety that you might be feeling. Okay, and then on the next slide, here we have provided a list of resources that you can use should you feel you need extra support or someone to talk to. Um, these resources will be shared with you at the end of the workshop. Um, thank you. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Boothley. Hi, everyone. Wow, that was so refreshing. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, now I feel like less stressed or like I feel more calm. Thank you so much, uh, Casey. Hi, everyone. My name is Boothley. I'm from Durban, born and raised that side. And after high school, I then went to the Eastern Cape to Rhodes University to pursue a degree that I actually didn't know what. I knew that I actually wanted to pursue a degree, but I didn't know actually what I really wanted to specialize in. So I actually, I tried almost all faculties. I've been to the drama department. I've been to ed sciences, geology, um, to computer science. I was all over. Until in my second year, I tried psychology. I registered for a psychology module. And that day I never looked back. I then walked out of Fraser University with an honors degree in organizational psychology, which I'm very passionate about. And I'm currently wa working at SACAB as a work integrated learning coordinator. So today I'm going to share with you some study tips that I research and study tips that actually worked for me during my grade 12 and my university career to prep for my exams. So the first thing I actually want you, I want to focus on is the environment. Um, the environment is very important when you prepare for exams. So research has shown that an engaged learning environment increases students' attention and focus, promotes meaningful learning experiences, encourages high levels of students' performance, and motivates students to practice high-level critical thinking skills. Research has all, also highlights that different places create different moods in, in oh, sorry guys, uh, research has also shown that different places create different moods. So studying in the library, in your bed, or in the kitchen is not the same. It will all have different experiences. For example, I cannot study in the library because uh, my attention span is free. Like, I struggle. Um, someone starts moving in the library, someone walks in, I'll just start looking at them. Oh, they're wearing that. I love what they're wearing. I love their bag. So that actually couldn't work for me. But I had a friend of mine actually who couldn't study anywhere but in the library. So in this as much in this space, I'd say actually do what works for you. If studying in the library works for you, studying in the library, if studying in your room works for you, I studied in my room and it pretty worked for me. Um, so create, create an environment which is conducive for your study time. Choose a place you can associate with studying. Your study should be available whenever you need it. Your study space should be available whenever you need it. Your study space should meet your study needs. Have all your stationary notes, textbooks, revision papers, water bottle, and your snacks ready at your study point to avoid disruption of walking up and down or to look for something. So I actually, when I'm in my environment, I had two environments, one for studying and one for revision. So when I was studying, I would probably sit at my desk and study. But when I was ready to revise whatever I've worked on, I would lie on the floor or go outside um, 
go outside by the trees or if you have a garden go by the garden that like, just to have some fresh air so now we're going to move into planning and then planning your study timetable and time management which actually work hand in hand together when you're preparing for your exam so this is very this is this is very important in this period for it helps you plan it's very important that you plan your study timetable in accordance with your exam timetable. Also tailor it in accordance with your most challenging subjects for you. The harder the subject, the more it gets time in your timetable. Include your breaks and revision time in your timetable too. You can even add your daily routine in there just to keep you just to keep you in track with your with your time management. So what do I mean by that? You can actually even I had my some time, my study timetable actually was pretty busy. Um, I had literally I put down breakfast time. I need to spend this amount of time breakfast. I need to spend this amount of time doing what. And this time I'm then studying maths, or in this time I'm then studying life sciences, you know. So yeah. So now we're gonna move on to planning your studying. So I have a subject overview. Um, a subject overview can come from your class notes, activities, your textbooks, independent research. So what do I mean by independent research? It's the research that you do outside whatever your teacher has recommended, outside whatever your textbook has recommended. That's the research I'm speaking about. You have to look at your past year papers and YouTube videos on the subject. Past year papers are very important. I normally use past year papers for testing myself and also for re revision purposes. When I couldn't understand a concept, I would actually always go to YouTube and there would be someone else actually explaining it in more, maybe in a more simpler way than the textbook or than the research. And then it will help, it will help me. So YouTube videos will help you a lot when you don't understand something. Let YouTube be your best friend. So my high school teacher, Mr. T Reddy, once told us that, once told us a great thing um, about studying for your exam. He said that reading your notes, textbook alone is not enough when prepping for your exams. You need to read, understand what you're reading, write it down in summary or in point form. Draw it if you can. Talk about it to your friends and family. So what do I mean write it, write it down in summary or point form? I don't mean that actually the copy and paste from your notes or copy and paste for your textbook. Close your textbook, close your notes, Grab a pen and a paper, roughly start writing down what you learned. Whatever you remember, write it down, you know. Um, so I also I spoke about, you can talk about it to your family and friends, or some, especially someone like your younger siblings or someone who has no idea what you're studying. And you can ask them, do you know what is a misfit? Uh, I'm sure if you if you have geography as one of your subjects, you, you, you must know what is a misfit. Um, so you ask someone, what is a misfit? And then you explain you explain a misfit is that broken moment in a river that has dried up, you know. So things like that. People have no idea what is a misfit, and it'll help you remember as well. If you're actually maybe doing life sciences, you can ask them, do you know what happens when you get when you get burnt by a stove? Those things actually help you remember better. And also you can test yourself and map it down. This will show a great understanding of the subject and will increase your confidence and self-esteem as the exam approaches. Also, so you've done all of that. You've planned your time, your study time, your study timetable, you've studied, you've written down your notes, you've summarized, you've mapped down, you talked to your family and friends. Now you feel good. You know, there's like, yeah, you feel good, you're ready to write this paper. But also always remember to actually reward yourself. And um, it has also been argued that actually reward is a great asset of motivation. So you can reward yourself after each goal that you set for yourself. Maybe after you successfully test yourself, give yourself some chocolate or your favorite snacks. Research also shows that you must include mints while you are studying for it increases your alertness, concentration, retention, while relieving stress and anxiety, you can also speak to someone who makes you happy that actually will actually also improve your mood. So this one is a mm, rough one. So decrease is greater than social media. So decrease your time on social media. TikTok and Netflix uh, will always be here after your exam. 
I know that actually sometimes, you know, relax, you just when I watch a quick TikTok. Um, I don't know, I've never met anyone actually who can watch a quick TikTok. It's a quick TikTok and then another TikTok and then another TikTok. And then realize actually we spend so much time on TikTok. We're like, okay, let me just watch one episode of Dynasty or whatever you watch on Netflix. And then it's like, oh, I need to know what happens in the next episode. So those things can actually disrupt you, you know? So try to avoid them actually, even, even during your study break. So when your study breaks, I actually advise you that you rather take a walk or read your favorite book or do something which does not involve so much social media or so much TV, because actually your brain has this thing that you actually mostly remember what you last saw. So if you want that saw a fight in Dynasty, that's mostly the like things you will remember than what's happening in life sciences. That's why I'd rather have you uh, taking a walk or reading your favorite book. So well-being, we're moving to well-being. This actually my colleague Casey has spoken a lot about and made us do that wonderful um, exercise earlier on. So well-being again, that's very important. Drinking your water, breathe especially when you're anxious i mean we just did a, a beautiful breathing exercise actually take that in and take that in whenever you're feeling anxious start breathing do your breathing exercises sleep well don't deprive your brain of sleep because you'll be tired the next day which will affect your concentration levels actually this once happened to me um because Geography has always been my favorite subject and I loved it so much. And I thought actually it was very good at geography. So um, I will not put that much time into studying. And I made a mistake that I studied at the night before. Um, bear in mind, I'm not a night person. I'm not a night study person. I prefer studying in the morning um, until the day, like from eight to five, I'm that person. And then nighttime I sleep. So I was like, nah, it's geography, man. I will study the night before and then I'll go ace the exam. And you know, geography is two papers, one paper in the morning, one paper in the afternoon. And I was tired the next day. Uh, by the time it was 2 p.m. to write paper two, I, I just wanted to get over and done with it. I was just writing and not even paying attention to silly mistakes uh, in my paper. And for and I actually paid, I paid the price, but I didn't get the desired results that I would have wanted or I would normally get in my geography exams because I was just I was battling throughout the day I was just so tired because I deprived myself of sleep um, so make sure that you actually prioritize your sleep try and get your full eight hours the moment you do that you're going to feel better energized to study for the next paper energized to to write the next exams so studies as old has also shown that brain function is mostly at 100% between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. Um, also 50% at 6 a.m. until 8 a.m. and 20% at night time. However, this can be subjective. So always do what works for you based on taking care of your well-being. And also do not forget to exercise with this as well. Um, especially with the times. I know some people study very well at night time. Some people study well at 4 a.m. I promise you, I do not study well at 4 a.m. because at 4 a.m. I'm fast asleep. <laughs> I am fast asleep at 4 a.m. I don't even wake up at 4 a.m. Um, maybe 6 a.m. That's when I would actually wake up 6 a.m., go, go take a shower, prep my desk and start studying. But 4 a.m. do not work for me. But if 4 a.m. works for you, go on and do so with this time thing i'd always say do what best for you find your time which works for you don't do what what works for your friend because it might not work for you but try find what works for you so thank you so much and all the best for exams and now i'm gonna actually hand you over to my colleague Gilo. hi guys um my name is Gilo van der Valt, and today i'll be speaking about fun versus focus um, the, and the interplay between them. I'm a third year student at SACAP studying counseling and psychology. I'm also vice chair of the SRC. Okay, let's begin. So on the first slide, we can see fun is an unconscious experience that varies over time from person to person. Um, but what does not vary is dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. 
plays an important role in bodily functions like movement, memory, pleasure, reward, and motivation. If we have lots of dopamine, um, we're very motivated to move and to do things. Dopamine is highest in the morning, which makes us feel awake and alert. I like to utilize this by doing the most difficult tasks during this time. Later in the day, our dopamine goes down and serotonin goes up, in which we feel more calm and happy. At this time, I like to utilize this by either engaging in creative work, exercise, video games, or other fun activities that makes me feel good. Yeah, as mentioned, fun is an unconscious experience. We do not choose what our brain regards as fun or how fun something is to us, but what we can regulate and balance is how much fun we have and how much we focus on task. Fun depends on the memories we associate with that experience. If we spend lots of time on one thing, we generally receive a lot of dopamine from that experience. This means that the more time we spend on certain activities, the more fun they become, or at least the more fun we make it. As such, such as exercise, which I'll get to in a minute. On the next slide, um, we can see that because the experience of fun varies due to the amount of dopamine we associate with it, we must ask ourselves how much fun is appropriate um, and conducive during exam times. Fun activities to do during exams to help us unwind but not distract off everywhere and easy. Tidying up, for instance, has immense possibilities to change our mindset for the better whilst not studying. Tidying up metaphorically means to sort things out, put them in the right place, manage what we can control, and to be in an organized functional environment. A room resembles our mind. To organize the environment is, in many ways, to organize the self. Showing yourself that you can create an organized space is to show yourself that you can organize. And this place is the ideal place for studying. Physical exercise is not only a fun activity, but it also helps us switch from fun to focus. If we return to our friend dopamine, we can understand that dopamine is limited. And when dopamine gets used with some activities, we often feel more energetic, um, but relaxed, more calm and more focused. This is the state that physical exercise can give us. Regular exercise remodels the reward system, leading to higher circulating levels of dopamine and more available receptors. Um, this means that exercise can motivate us in many spheres of life, um, even with studying. This way, exercise, a fun activity, increases our focus, motivation, and pleasure with various things. Try it. If you're struggling to sit down and concentrate, do some exercise and see whether or not it helps you switch from fun to focus. Music is also a great activity to rewind and motivate, um, given its ability to uplift our mood and energize us. Snacks, obviously, because it provides us with glucose, which significantly improves long-term verbal memory and long-term spatial memory. Okay, if we move on to the next slide, um, what exactly focus means? Focus is concentrating on a specific stimuli, whether it's the textbook, your phone, the boy next door, or your Xbox. With too much stress or arousal or performance, um, to focus becomes impaired, as seen on the graph. However, an appropriate amount of anxiety and stress, an amount that doesn't cause feelings of overwhelm, overwhelmment, um, helps us focus. As such, ask yourself before you're studying, why is this important? And how can I minimize my stress towards the exam? This could help put you in a mindset of ideal focus. And if we move on to the next slide, um, we look at how we can um, we look at how can we control our focus in order to switch from having fun to focus. As mentioned, our, our brain are powered by the chemical dopamine. It's what motivates us, grips our attention, and causes us to engage in everything that we do. Doing something that's difficult, meaning it causes less dopamine than, say, video games, is best done with the without the temptation of desire. For that reason, eliminating distractions is an easy way that we can improve focus, concentration, and predict productivity to get the work done. This is why I like playing video games in the evening after the day of studying. This is because we receive a lot of dopamine from video games, which is why they are so enjoyable. Downside, however, is that other activities like studying won't be nearly as rewarding neurochemically as video games. It might be very hard for another experience to top gaming, so our attention remains on the video game. 
if we try to study afterwards. This is why I believe that TV and video games are bad during study breaks. As such, generally activities to avoid during exams are extended maps, naps, TV, video games as mentioned, and social media as mentioned um, before. The first ties us. Um, it's hard to get back to studying after taking a long nap. TV, video games, and social media puts us minds in a unpredictable and uncertain state. Um, these are great for exploration because they breed uncertainty. They occupy our attention long after we stop watching TV or scrolling TikTok. Such try our best to avoid these activities before studying or keep them as brief as possible as not to occupy your attention. Setting appropriate goals can also um, increase our arousal and concentration by using our stress to our advantage. Also, the best environment to focus is one that is clear and organized as our environment tends to resemble our minds. Diet, um, breakfast with carbohydrates helps power the brain with glucose. However, you also wanna include some healthy fats like avocado, eggs, or mushrooms as fuel for our brain to help sustain focus and attention. I like to also switch up tasks. Um, when you get frustrated with a particular task like math, take a break, have some fun, and then come back doing a different task or subject like history. It's because coming back to a difficult task or frustrating objective is much harder than starting something new or different. Switching tasks is fun with fun in between is a great way to keep motivated and ease studying. Finally is the 15 minute rule. I use this throughout my matric exams and still do today. Um, you don't always have to do another task to switch to. Um, and sometimes you have to solve a math problem or write an essay. If you're struggling to start, try concentrating for at least 15 minutes on the task. I've always found that no matter how unmotivated I am after having fun, after 15 minutes of engaging with a book or subject, I get into the rhythm and feel much more motivated to complete and finish the task. I always try at least 15 minutes on a task before considering switching the task or taking a break. Thanks for listening. And now we'll switch back to Kirsten. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, a big thank you to all three of our, our panelists for this morning, um, Casey Buchler and Guillaume. Thank you for sharing that information with us. I feel that it was quite well rounded and I'm sure that it's given our attendees something to think about. What do you feel is the best amount of time for study periods? Most optimal time towards each period? I know, Bukhle, you spoke a little bit about having a timetable and breaking things up. Maybe you can just expand a little bit more um, on that for us. Um, hi, Seth. Thank you for your question. Um, how, what do I feel the amount of time for study periods? So I'd say, um, I think one of the slides it showed like, um, a kind of like an exam timetable or a study timetable. So it depends how much information also you want to retain at that very moment and also depending on the subject. So maybe um, always, uh, what I've always done, I had um, the maybe the harder subject at first and then below that I had maybe a low there, which is a bit lighter, but maybe I'd put in two hours max. Um, sometimes I put in one hour max, also depending on the subject and how, how I struggle with the subject and how challenging the subject. For example, for maths, I would put maybe straight two hours because it's just me working. And then in that two hours, I divided, I divided the one hour, it's just me going through my notes and going through the textbook and writing things down. And the second hour, it's me going through past year papers, testing myself. So that's how I actually kind of divided it. I'm not sure if I've answered your question adequately. Thank you, Kirsten. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I, I think let me touch on the next question that we have here. I just I think it's quite a good one in terms of asking, um, is it beneficial to listen to music when studying? Um, if so, what type of music? So I think that this one really does depend on each individual. Um, some people thrive when they have loud music in the background others need complete silence um, 
when when they are focusing and they are studying so it really does depend my suggestion would be to try it out i mean a lot of this is going to be trial and error to figure out what works for you i think it was casey that mentioned a little bit earlier that they are all of these options and their suggestions and things that you can try but it is trial and error um, there isn't a one size fits all when it when it comes to this so what i would recommend there is trying out different types of music try out even silence and see what feels the best um, at the end of the day you'll know what what works for you um, okay cool next one is for you galome um, are there any apps that help with studying and concentration yeah so um an app that i used especially during my trick is called forest um for your phone um i think it's about 16 rand but it's pretty cool so you plant certain trees so you click on um plant a tree and then the tree will finish planting in an hour but as soon as you use your phone during that time the tree dies so you have a little forest that you try and grow for motivation but as soon as you go on your phone during the hour that you set the tree dies and so you want to make it look really beautiful because it's a, quite a cool app and you try and make your forest look big big meaning you've studied lots of hours um and yeah so that's that's a really fun app that i've used it's also apps like notion online which is great for um typing and making if you like making notes um without actually writing as i do um notion's a great app for making summaries and notes Wonderful. Definitely sounds interesting. I can't say I've ever heard of the forest one before, but I do think that it could be really beneficial. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, okay, Buchle, we've got one for you. Um, so this attendee says that their notes are on their phone, but every time they try and study, they end up on Facebook. What can they do better in terms of this? Um, hi, this is Sikelelo. Sorry about that. Hi. Um, I'm actually there. I saw one of your questions. Also, I'm gonna just to if you don't mind kissing, I'm also gonna answer it as well. Um, because I also did history as well. So my notes have been on phone, but every time I try to study, I end up on Facebook. So two things. Try get your notes out of your phone. Secondly, if you cannot do that, put your phone in airplane mode, mode, switch off your data, switch off your Wi-Fi. Um, so you can study better on that. If you can't, let's say your notes are online, try and write down your notes, move them away from your phone to a place where actually where you won't end up on Facebook. Um, so how do you memorize your history essays? You do not memorize, you learn how to write it down. Because when you memorize, the bad thing about memorizing, you forget one word, you start to panic and you've forgotten your whole entire essay. Um, so I, what I used to do, I used to write that I know in my trick you write, I think you write four essays. Um, I, I made sure that I chose my topic in advance. So the moment I go into the exam room, I know what I'm going to write about. And I've already written about it before. So write your essay in different ways, time and a time again. So until you know, you learn it, you know what it says, you know what happens with Rosa Parks, you know what happened with Mandela with everything with the trc you write especially you highlight the important words which will remind you what is the next paragraph so i actually plan it to to paragraph to each paragraph you know in paragraph one i'm focusing on my introduction my introduction is going to focus on this is what i'm going to speak about in this paper i'm going to highlight civil rights movement in the civil rights movements i'm going to speak about martin luther king i'm going to speak at rosa parks i'm going to speak about uh, whoever you're speaking about. And then you go to your body, into your body. Then again, you go back to your paragraph and read has actually in my paragraph, I said, I'm going to speak about this and that and that. Now you speak about those things that you're going to speak about into your body. And then in your conclusion, you write your, your concluding arguments of what you've already spoken about. So plan your essay. Everything is in your introduction. Break that introduction into a into a body and then conclude at the end and i'm sure you will get a, a good essay thanks Kirsten. i hope i answered you well Bobby. that's perfect thank you so much for that um our next question is 
around how to actually get started. So, yeah, I think I'll answer this one because I, I get the sense when we need to tackle something like exams, um, it takes a while for us to start thinking of what we need to do and how we're going to go about doing it. Honestly, the best advice that I can give you is to just start, even if it is just putting together a study area, even if it is just starting to plot down the different dates of the exams and how much time that you have, break it up into small manageable pieces and then you are able to tackle it a lot better. Because sometimes we can feel so overwhelmed about how to get started that we just don't and it's easier to put it off. Break it up into small pieces and try to challenge yourself to do a, a small piece every day. Before you know it, you've taken this sort of mammoth task that seems overwhelming and it seems, you know, um, so, so large. You've taken that and you've broken it down and it actually feels like you, you can tackle it. Another thing they would have would be goals. So that helps you stay focused and stays constant with it because i think once you start you can be motivated and everything can be great but then the question is how do i maintain my motivation how do i maintain it for the whole duration of exams when i am feeling a little bit overwhelmed more tired and all of that so we look at goals and we look at honestly just get started that's the the main thing that you that you can do and don't put too much pressure on yourself about doing everything kind of perfectly there's no set way. We've spoken about that today. There's no one size fits all. So you need to find what works for you. You can chat to your friends about what works for them, but it doesn't mean it's gonna have that same impact with you. You have to try it out for yourself. Um, <clears throat> my next question is gonna be for Casey. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, this attendee is um, essentially saying that they struggle to remember everything that they've learned so when they're feeling you know under pressure when they're feeling stressed when it comes to doing the actual exam they feel like they forget everything that they've prepared for um how can they keep focused on the things that they can do um okay so with regards to stress um we know that or i've mentioned that stress affects our ability to remember things especially when we experience a lot of anxiety, anxiety, especially with exams. And I think that's why, you know, I have provided those techniques and everything that you can use um, when you are experience, experiencing stress. So whether it be when you are studying or when you are actually writing exams, um, when you place your body in that sort of relaxed, relaxed space, apart from the stress that you might feeling, you might be feeling, sorry, um, you, you sort of inhibit, well, not inhibit, you help your ability to remember the information that you have learned while you're studying, because that's what stress does. Stress inhibits your ability to remember sometimes. So when you put yourself or place yourself in that relaxed, sp relaxed space while you are studying or while you are writing your exam, um, you know, you're not sort of thinking immediately of the stress regarding answering questions. It's more of, you know, you're relaxed now and you are thinking of the information that you learn and how best you can answer the question. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question to um, my best of my ability, but, you know, the deep breathing techniques, um, the mindfulness techniques, they're all things that you can use when you are feeling stressed. And it's then up to you to sort of find what works for you in terms of what can take you away from the stress that you are feeling into that relaxed state where you feel like you can sort of focus on the topics that you do know when you are studying or when you are writing exams, um, focusing on the information that you do know before stressing about the information you don't know. So it's really um, something that you need to work with where you find what you can or what technique works best for you in terms of um, trying to remain focused on the topics that you can answer and not stressing about what you don't necessarily know. So I hope that does answer your question, um, but yeah. Thanks, Casey. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, okay, another one that I'll uh, just hand over to Galome. I think we have spoken a little bit about motivation, but maybe if there's anything additional you'd like to add for the attendees in terms of how do you motivate yourself to actually study? 
Yeah, so um, I think it's important to note that motivation means you want something and nobody wants to study, or at least nobody I know wants to study. So there's been great research done on how writing your goals has an effect on your grade point average. And so what I would recommend is write down your big overarching goal. What do you want to achieve with your life? Or at least what you think you want to achieve with your life. Break it down. How will a middle-term goal, say a two-year goal, help you achieve that? And how will a one-month goal help you achieve that? And so studying for the sake of studying will not motivate you. You need to study for the sake of a bigger picture. And so writing down your goals helps a lot. And also motivation is limited. The point of motivation in our brains is to create a habit. After a while, motivation will decrease naturally as it takes a lot of metabolic energy. So the point of motivation is to create a habit. Your role is to make sure that that habit stays in place. Um, and yeah, so I best recommend is writing down and the 15 minute method when you're really not um, motivated. Sit down, try 15 minutes. If you can't, then ask yourself why you can't. Look at the bigger picture. Look at what you want to achieve. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, <clears throat> my next question is going to be for Buchle. Um, So if we, so for example, if you have quite a bit of time left to study and you have quite a few subjects that you need to do, what would you recommend? Would you recommend sticking to one subject per day or would you recommend breaking it up? I know it's quite a subjective question, but I'm interested to hear your answer. <laughs> Um, uh, hi Lillian. So um, this one again, I would never advise to study one subject a day for a whole entire day because it can be overwhelming. You can overwhelm yourself, you can overwhelm your brain with a lot of information of one thing. So it's, I always advise people to split up. Even if your, your exams um, are close by, you know, as that's that's why it's very important that you start studying way before your exams, so you can have enough time for exams. That when the few weeks are come, you just when the few weeks come, you only left with just revision to do, not studying. So I'd always, um, I'd never advise to study one exam because the other exams will suffer because you've filled yourself so much with information, with life sciences, you still have physics, you still have business studies to study. Now you end up performing badly for the other subject because you focus more on the other subject, you know? And so I'd say, again, write it down in your timetable, give each time, let's say you have a few weeks left, Monday um, from nine to, nine to 11, I'm doing life sciences, 11 to 12, I'm doing physics, break time again. So make sure that you give each subject each amount of time, especially the ones maybe they're more challenging to you. Um, yeah, I don't know, if, Kristen, I don't know if I answered you all. Definitely, thank you for that, Buclair. Um, so while I've got you, I've just got another question for you. Um, how does one prepare for life orientation? Um, yeah, any sort of guidance on tackling that specific subject? Um, yeah, with that, um, I don't know how life orientation is tested now, but I know back in our days, you know, I feel very old right now. <laughs> we used to have we used to have assignments for life orientation in grade 12. We never had an exam, we never had a sit that like sit down exam. It was just assignments, you know. So I don't know, uh Sisi how you guys do it now, but as in um in a form of an exam or in a form of essay, again, you go over the information that you have. You ask your teacher of things that you don't understand. You write down, you do research. I know especially life orientation had um, a lot of life experiences that you were given, um, like maybe how to overcome, how to advise someone with a drug problem, alcohol abuse. I know I also met you, we had a huge thing on how to manage stress. Um, so I'd suggest that you actually do a lot of research about those life things and um, try and also and put the life in it, which is relatable as well and be realistic with your essays that you write. Um, again, we wrote a lot of essays, we wrote an assessment for not a sit down exam. So also again, you write your assessment, ask your teacher, 
um, or maybe a friend that think you think is actually much more strong in life orientation than you or ask them for help, write them that essay. And again, even if you're writing an exam of it, research and research in those problems and how people overcome it, research on reha rehabilitation techniques that are done, which how you can argue your case there with it as well. Thanks, Kristen. Hmm, definitely. I think just to add on that one as well, I think life orientation is a lot of application. So generally, no matter what the format of the sort of exam or essay or whatever it may be, generally you are looking at um, application to general life issues that come up. So exactly like Bukle was mentioning about things like drug abuse or when um, it's things like safe sex, it's, it's all of those kind of topics that it would be important to do your own research on that as well. Um, so no matter what the format of the exam or assessment is, um, the content generally does remain the same. Um, okay, I have a question for Steph. Um, so a very relevant question in today's times, just in terms of load shedding and ESCOM problems. What happens if you have your plan and you decide that you want to study at a certain time and unfortunately your electricity goes? How would you manage this? Yeah, Chris, I, um, I just have to check. You can hear me? Thumbs up is fine or something. Yes. Um, so just, it is a bit of a, a, you know, a snag in everybody's plans, but there are lots of apps currently that uh, notify you quite well in advance when your power is due to go off. So um, I think like on Google Play or the Play Store or um, the iStore, you'll find apps that like the load shedding notifier. And you can put in your area code and they'll give you like the times that you're due to go off. Um, so I tend to use this when planning a lot of my day to ensure that my, um, Basically, my electronics are charged um, and that they're ready to go. Sometimes I'll switch a kettle on five minutes before the time. I think if it does happen at a time when the power is going off and you're going to have no light source, maybe having candles or, um, you know, torches, battery operated lights around you. Um, if you are, if it's possible, plan maybe your study session before that when you do have power, if you're using your laptop or your phone to maybe then write down notes so that you can read your notes um, when you've got no power to, to power your electronics. Um, and maybe also it will help you instead plan your break times during the time you don't have power so that you can study when you do have power. It isn't a one foot one size fits all solution for everybody, but there are ways to obviously mitigate that. And the one thing that I've personally had experience with in my own studies is um, getting a notification notification the day of having to submit an assignment, um, and effectively having two hours cut off my submission time. So that is also where planning comes in to ensure that you know you aren't doing everything at the absolute last minute and rather that you're just doing the small stuff that you are able to do to make that deadline. Um, yeah, I hope that helps a bit. Definitely, thanks for Steph. Yeah, as I mentioned, something very relevant for, for today's times. Um, okay, so our, our next question, I'll just answer and then Bukhli, I'll see if you want to add anything onto that. Um, so the question is essentially, would you know one recommend writing when studying because sometimes people aren't able to write or there are challenges there. Um, so what I can say here is that it's important to find out what the learners learning style actually is because there are a lot of different learning styles um, not everyone learns the same way and that's why it does become quite challenging when giving guidance on studying because it, it really does depend on that person's learning style so there are even some quizzes that you can do online where you can answer a couple of questions and kind of figure out your learning style and i think that's a really nice activity um, to do when sort of guiding learners um, because i understand that's you know where your question is coming from um i do know that we are going to share the um i know we are going to share the links to our previous study hack um campaign where we did cover different topics as well that can be beneficial so all of those resources will be sent sent out to you 
And in last year's one, we did cover the specific learning styles and how to kind of figure out what works for you. Um, so I would dec definitely recommend um, having a look at those resources that can be quite beneficial um, and quite a nice activity to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So that would be my suggestion there. Writing doesn't work for everyone and that's fine. That is okay. Um, it, it, the most important thing is trying to figure out what does work for you. Um, Rukhle, I don't know, do you want to add on to that? Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, that's very true. Um, it's very important that you actually find your vibe, what really works for you when you're studying. Um, so yeah, but just to answer you, Zerita, like, um, what are the benefits of writing what I've seen? So benefits of writing, it's actually can be, it makes you realize that you actually, whatever you were reading or studying, you understand it. It's like reading for understanding. And also it boosts how well you remember information. Um, the moment you write something, it's very easy to remember it. I don't know if you know, if you've noticed, or especially let's say you're asking someone for directions, just like, oh, let me write it down. You write it down, it's much more easier for you to remember than actually memorizing anything. That's all. So, how then do you start writing? Because I can see um said some of you are not able to write. Um, you only start it in really in, in sentences, basically, in your own understanding. Um, what were you reading about, let's say, about Steve Beagle? Um, I write what I like, that book, I know we kind of did that in history. What then do you write about it? What do you understand about I write what I like? What then do you also understand about Othello? Um, all those creative writing things, you don't have to be actually be um, super, especially you're writing for studying. It doesn't have to be super ac academic to it. Just write what you know about the subject write what you understand about that subject and you write in a little bit of pieces. You can start by just a sentence into a paragraph and then into an essay. But the most important thing for me is just say, just find your study with them, find what works for you, just like uh, Kirsten said. But when you decide to write, just write what you understand. And then you can go back to your notes and match with that and see, oh, maybe I, I explained it uh, in a different way. This is how it should be. And then you know how to actually, how to pin it down properly. Thank you, Kirsten. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, our last question for today is going to go to Casey. Um, so Casey, do you have any tips for memorizing definitions? Yes, so something that I used for my exams, especially when it came to history and knowing all the different dates and the events, or even for definitions, is the use of flashcards. So on the one side of your flashcard, you would have maybe the, the term, and then on the other side, you have the definition. So in order to use the flashcard, you, you obviously need to have an understanding of what the definition of the term is or what the term is in relation to the definition that is provided. But then you sort of test yourself to see if you see the term, for example, photosynthesis, and you wanna now know the definition of it. Um, you test yourself to say photosynthesis is the um, process in which plants sort of um, make food, I think. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> but, you know, just as an example, so you sort of test yourself on, the, the definition of the term as well as the term associated with the definition that you are reading. Um, so it becomes sort of like a quiz as opposed to just like learning the definition off by heart. So you understand, you're seeing what do you understand of the term um, that's on your flashcard. So it's so I, it is sort of um, a technique or a tip that you can use when study, um, learning definitions. Um, but yeah, just give it a try and see how it sort of works for you. Thank you. Awesome. I think that's a good example. Thanks, Casey. Um, Steph, I know that you also want to share a little bit about what works, what has worked for you with yeah. regards to memorizing definitions. Yeah. Um, for me, it was definitely breaking things down. Um, so as Brooklyn mentioned, writing was one of my um, best study styles. So what I would do is I would break down the actual definition into um and i take out like your articles what's like v and a i'd break it down into bullet point form and basically i'd remember those bullet points 
and the sentence will eventually just form itself in your mind. Um, so that was one of the things that worked for me for definitions um, in history as well. It was one of the subjects I did um, for remembering dates and so on, because you'd be able to, once you understood the story, as long as you had the facts parts, um, sort of like bullet pointed, you'd be able to just pull them into the story um, and into your sentences and so on. So that's just, I think, um, another way um, that could work. Thanks. Definitely. Thank you so much for that one, Steph. Um, so that actually brings us to the end of the Q&A session. There's quite a few things that are often um, happening, um, not only online, but also um, at our campuses. So if you are interested in anything, just you know, follow us on any of these platforms and you will be able to stay up to date with everything that is there. So once again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day further.